welcome to the third chapter of Kikaz Found series. Today we have three amazing panelists who are going to talk to you about logistics and operations uh, in a crisis. So let me first introduce you to these three amazing ladies. Uh, first, we have Savanti Virakon, who is the CEO and co-founder of Shulia Studio. Um, so Shulia Studio is the is a novelty gift store with a range of products that are customizable, and they are also the pioneers of nail and string arts in Sri Lanka. So then we also have. Zainab Miskin, a co-founder of Lilac Cocoons. It is, again, another where, uh, place where you can find handmade novelty gifts for every occasion. So we also have Hafsa Kaza, who is the founder of Oopsie Daisy, uh, which, is a flor uh, which is a florist curating fresh flower bouquets for any occasion. So all these three ladies are going to share their experience, knowledge, and insights into how they handle logistics and operations during this crisis. So let's move on to the, uh, the find out what, what they have been doing so far. So uh, welcome ladies for the panel. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation and uh, joining hands with us. Hi. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay, Thank you so, uh, so let's move on to uh, Savanti first. Hi, Savanti. Um, Hi. So, uh, so you Shule Studio um, celebrated six years recently, and uh, how has that six years of the journey been so far? And how, uh, like, how has was it when you started off uh, something which has never been done in Sri Lanka? How, what's your experience being like? Yeah, uh, thanks, Asmini. Honestly, like, I also can't believe it's been six years. It's just gone by so fast. Um, it's definitely been such a roller coaster ride, I wouldn't lie, but um, it's rewarding, like, definitely rewarding. Uh, when we started this six years ago, we launched at uh, this market called Colombo Design Market. Um, and I remember the night before the market, you know, once we had all these products ready, I spoke to my partners and I was like, well, how if no one buys these products? Because it's not something that was out there. How if they don't like it? And then we were like, you know what? I mean, if they don't, they don't. And we'll just, you know, do something else. And on the day of the market, we had all these customers come in and their feedback was really, really positive. Everyone liked it. They were amazed by the string art. They were like, oh, this is really cool. We sold out all the string art pieces that we made uh, at that market and we had orders for new products uh, for the months ahead. And that market was really the deciding factor of, you know what, people do appreciate this thing. There is a market for this and there are people who would buy this product. Because when we launched, then we were actually all over the place uh, with our string art and our boards. We also had t-shirts, we had cookies, Christmas decor. We were just, you know, trying all these different uh, different products, but um, that market and meeting the clients really helped us understand what kind of product base that we need to go forward with. And that is really how this journey started. Um, and now six years later, you know, I see all these other brands who do, you know, this decor, who do string art, who do posters. And it's so nice to see that there are other girls and boys like me who have now made an income, made a business avenue through, you know, through this art. So it's really great. And it's uh, been a great experience. Uh, it must have been a very rewarding journey to uh, yeah. the past six years to see everything uh, unfold like that. And like, uh, I, I remember, like, I found out about string art through your page only. So like, that was like two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, so so uh, congratulations on that, uh, on this uh, six year anniversary as well. Uh, so Zainab, <laughs> uh, um, so you launched uh, Lilac Cocoons a month before the lockdown in February, right? So, and uh, the concept of lilac cocoons is also similar as in, similar as in like uh, to what Savanti tried, right? Savanti started six years ago and uh, Zainab is try like is in the same place right now, trying to do something very new and uh, going into the market, right? So what has, has been that experience be like and how has it been so far? 
Thank you, Sashini. And true, yes, we have uh, just now when Savanti was speaking, all I could think about was just a few months back, I was exactly where she was. Um, it has definitely been a roller coaster. When we started off in February, our first pop up sale was actually a patch. And uh, we sold quite a few love packs, which were actually what we started off with. Uh, so they went really well, and we had a few other pop ups as well. And we had uh, begun our, you know, production for the next few months as well. And uh, but then, of course, disaster struck. <laughs> it struck, and uh, everything went down. To be honest, like it got to a point where we weren't having a single sale. And I, all I was wondering was, what am I going to do with all these stock? How am I going to get rid of them? How am I going to grow this business? Because after the pop-up sales and being able to communicate with customers and all of that, I realized that there definitely is a market for this and that I can't give up just because of this issue. So anyway, we uh, persevered and we got selected, of course, to the kick-ass boot camp and that changed a lot of things for us. Um, so what we started doing was we actually started diversifying our portfolio. We started working on products that people actually needed. So in this case, what we did was we started working on products that uh, people needed, uh, things that didn't require import materials or ingredients, as well as uh, things that we could manufacture in small capacity and so that we could... Uh, keep things dynamic given the situation because all of a sudden like the roads are open we are able to go and meet our customers but then all of a sudden it's closed <laughs> so, <laughs> we're starting to work on all of that and it truly has been quite a ride and um, today we have actually grown uh, from our reach just in Colombo to actually island wide and uh, we have a portfolio of over five categories that are dynamic um, the, we have a community of customers, suppliers, partners, and all these wonderful ladies who are so tight, so supportive, and reliable. And um, to be honest, one of the biggest things we take away from this experience is that um, is a is the is the fact that we understood what our strengths were, and it built on our confidence. Because, um, and I'd like to quote Oprah Winfrey on this, um, where there. There is no struggle, there is no strength. So that is how our journey has been so far. Thank you. Yes, it, it's, it must have been an amazing journey and like it must have been really hard because like you start off in February and the next thing you know, like uh, the entire country is on lockdown and uh, what happens with the logistics and everything, <laughs> let's find out in the next segment. Uh, so Hafsa, um, I love Oopsie Daisy, the name itself, mm -hmm. and uh, we sort of know what it, why it is behind the, uh, the meaning behind that name itself. So would you like to share like why did you start off doing something exciting and fun like this, trying out new things, and uh, how has that journey been so far? Um, so like the lady said, it has been such a roller coaster, and anyone who starts a business knows that there are your extreme highs and your extreme lows. So how we started basically is, uh, I've always been into events. I'm an interior designer by profession. Um, so I've been in, doing events, I've been doing interiors, and I've always loved that. Uh, and I remember like always having a Pinterest board saying florist. And it was always like, a like yeah, in 10 years, in 20 years, I think about it. But after I got married, my husband really pushed me and he said, just start it. Like, you, there's no harm in starting and see how it works. So we started and there was like an overwhelming response uh, and we had followers after followers every single day and it was just like whoa. <laughs> um, so we started it and it was good and for those who don't know the reason we are called it today is because we are the clumsiest. We as in me, I drop everything, I spill my water, I spill my tea, I drop my phone, I cut my hands sometimes when I'm cutting class. So. Oh <laughs> um, but it's been a roller coaster, and we are so blessed to see how many people actually like what we're doing and we love doing unusual 
and personalizing our new jersey moments. So yes, it's been a roller coaster, it's been a tough one, but it's been super rewarding. That is great to hear. <laughs> like all three of you have had a very tough journey at the same time. Uh, it has been very rewarding. Uh, so uh, that is great to hear as female founders as well. Uh, uh, the journey has, it might be tough, but uh, it is the same for everyone uh, right now because of the, the crisis that we are in, right? Um, so let's move into like the how you guys handled logistics and operations during this crisis. Um, so uh, let me um, uh, ask from Savanti first. Um, so you must have had dealt with count uh, countless number of suppliers for the past few years. And like, uh, would you like to share what sort of challenges you faced when dealing with them and how you overcame those uh, for everyone to hear? Yeah, Sasmi, definitely like the challenges have been multiple, I would not lie. Um, every time there is a challenge, you know, I overcome it, I incorporate in my process and I'm like, okay, everything's all good. And then another challenge would come across in a completely different area. So one key thing to you know note when you are doing a business is that there are going to be challenges um, and it's going to come at times that are critical. You can't get upset or frustrated at those times. You have to kind of separate yourself and your emotions from the business and kind of switch gears and see, okay, how can I fix this? How can I move, move forward? And then incorporate all those obstacles into your process also so that it doesn't happen again. One big challenge that I had, you know, a year into us being in business in 2015 was uh, for the first time, I had also signed up to do two pop-ups simultaneously during Christmas. So a very busy time. Um, and, you know, I had ordered all my raw materials, my wood and everything. And I kind of went to collect it. Um, and this uh, wood place was closed. Um, the person who's working there is not picking up his phone. And then the people, you know, around just came and they were like, oh, he's kind of left and he's gone to his town and he's coming next month. Um, and then here I am, like, I am like three days away from two pop-ups. Now I don't have my raw material. Um, and overnight I had to really find another like wood supplier. And also, you know, I needed them to give it to me that day. It was like a really short timeline. I had to kind of, you know, work really hard and figure this out where my quality is also not compromised. So that experience really made me realize that you can't have one supplier. You need to have supplier A, B, C, D. Like it's good to have like a pool of supplies for anything, be it your packaging, even the paint you use, any little thing that goes into your product, like have multiple suppliers and work with them where they also meet the standard that you want in your end product. So that whenever you need to switch, you know, you're able to do that. And I had to do that during the pandemic as well, because my key wood supplier was kind of stuck out of Colombo. So because I had my option BCD and say they could only give a smaller scale, I was able to kind of work with them and get the raw material that I needed. Um, so I think it's like very important to have that supplier base um, and build upon that. No matter how small your business is, it's important to have that so you can face any obstacle that you come across. Okay, so um, it is very important to have uh, like multiple suppliers as your options as well and as well um, suppliers who understand your brand value, right? Uh, okay. Without compromising the quality of your brand uh, because at the end of the day, um, the, just like when we had the chat where you said like, the customer deal with you, the startup, the, uh, the business, not with the supplier. So you can't compromise the quality of your products just because you the delivery company is bad or yeah. the supplier is not providing the proper uh, wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So learning from all the challenges you have faced is one way to uh, sort of overcome the challenges you are going to face at the uh, end of the day as well, right? Um, so uh, let's move to uh, Zena. Uh, so Zainab, right, you started right before COVID and um, you must have had so many challenges coming your way and you must have had like things you were not in the business for that long. You must have had like 
to think a lot. Uh, they had to find solutions really quickly and overcome all those challenges very quickly as well. Uh, so would you like to share a bit about the challenges that you faced and uh, sort of how you overcame those? Sure, thank you. Yes, so like you said, yes, uh, when we started just before COVID, um, I wasn't aware of anything, to be honest. I just had like one, two suppliers, oh, okay, we can manage this and we can like slowly build. Like that was my mentality right at the start, right? But uh, suddenly I'm just thrown in this hot pan. <laughs> I just started, I, I remember just shriveling up like a prawn. But um, so, so the biggest problems, of course, were all related to our supply chain, right? So, and since we are so concerned about also achieving the triple bottom line, we had to make sure that the sustainability element was also satisfied, no matter what. Like Savanti said, just because someone, you know, one of our partners or suppliers can't deliver doesn't mean that our quality has to be compromised or can be compromised in that case. So one of the first issues that we faced was with sourcing. Some materials that we were getting and ingredients that we were getting, we were getting it all the way from the US or Australia. So with the import restrictions, we couldn't get any of that. And for example, we had, we had to actually uh, discontinue one of our products, uh, which was selling really well. And um, what we did was we started looking for locally produced ingredients and uh, locally produced materials that we could substitute and maneuver through this problem. The second issue that we faced was with production. So now due to the isolations and the curfews and the sudden restrictions, uh, we are unable or we, we would face uh, fluctuations in being able to actually get our own artisans to our studio to get the products made. Since we are, you know, selling the idea of handmade novelty gifts, we can't sell gifts that are not made by hand. <laughs> we can't do that without our artisans. So again, what we did was we started looking at whoever was available, whoever wasn't in isolated areas, uh, we started matching that with resources that were available as well as customer demands. And uh, we started building products that uh, we were able, in small batches of course, building products that we were able to sell. For example, our care box. Now that has hand sanitizers, hand wash. Now we were able to source them. And then we were able to put our labels and put the packaging and all. But still that is again because of this issue because we couldn't go beyond them, but it was a really innovative product and, and it sold and it sells, right? And then the other issue was of course with logistics, again, because of the isolations and the road closures, uh, there were several instances where we couldn't deliver to our uh, customers, customers who had even paid in advance because all of a sudden their area had got closed down. So then what we had to do was we, we decided, okay, uh, if those customers have already paid, we will somehow get the products to them. So in our case, we found certain uh, uh, delivery partners who were able to access those areas. So at least go halfway so those people could reach them. And uh, so after that, what we started doing was we started communicating this issue, the potential delays to our customers prior to them placing the orders so that their expectations and our abilities are you know, matched. And uh, finally, of course, in the case of sustainability, uh, like I said, we, we are really concerned about achieving the triple bottom line, which is benefits for the people, the planet, as well as our profits. Uh, but while it was already hard, very difficult for us to maintain that prior to COVID, it became a Herculean task for us to do it with COVID, with all these restrictions and all of that. However, what we started doing was uh, we took a step back. We started using our imagination and allowed it to run wild. And that is <laughs> how the upcycled earrings also came to be. And uh, so that's, that's how we've been handling it. That's how it has all been going. So you are being true to yourself. Um, uh, the thing that uh, 
innovation is at the heart of the startups. So all two of you guys have been <laughs> doing the same uh, for just like all the other founders as well. Uh, thinking out of the box, you know, trying to think of innovative, creative ways uh, out of uh, your challenges and that is impressive. Um, uh, so Hafsa, um, that I know that uh, you have, uh, so you guys have made some changes in your operations uh, during the crisis as well. Uh, would you like to share like how well those changes um, were done and how you overcame the challenges by getting used to new things? Of course. So one of our biggest challenges is because of the travel restrictions that everybody faced, we couldn't get flowers down and we had so much of limitations and we had a very limited quantity of flowers. And we were just like, oh no, what can we do? So we had to really think out of the box and what we thought of doing was we thought of incorporating fruits with flowers because fruits were available abundantly, right? Uh, so, and we had Mother's Day coming up and everyone was like inquiring about Mother's Day because of course everyone's locked down in their houses and they would like want to send flowers to their moms. Um, so we thought we'll put a collection out with fruits and flowers for Mother's Day and it turned out really well and there was a really, really good turnout. So that, just the limited flowers was such a big struggle for us. And I remember the second lockdown when it happened, we just thought, okay, let's do a lockdown menu and say, these are the flowers that are available. And we had to put like a lockdown menu and get people to deliver card, like select from that menu only. Uh, and another issue we had was I have two people who are working for me and it's really difficult because one of uh, my one of my employees is still under lockdown. Uh, so what we do and what I would advise all startups to do is before we used to have like an order book. We used to write down the orders physically, but now everything's on Google Sheets. And I just feel like it makes so much sense to put them down on a cloud or your Google Drive, Google Sheets, Google Docs. It makes so much sense to have it up on a cloud because say just in case someone else goes on lockdown, you'll always have it on your cloud. Um, and that has been helping us so much because I remember like a couple of weeks ago, so we just can't went to lockdown. And that helped because we had already taken orders. So we kind of picked up from that uh, and it would be such a struggle if we had physically kind of written everything down and just being prepared, I feel like is key. Just just in case one of us going to lockdown, I feel like everything's on the cloud and it's safe for them. And another thing is like Savanti and Zainab said, you have to always have a backup plan A, B and C all the time. Because uh, even for the Mother's Day, we had organized two delivery guys because we had deliveries in Kote, we had deliveries in Mount Lavinia and all like whole opposites. Uh, and one of them last minute couldn't come. Uh, and thankfully, just in case we thought, okay, plan C, we'll get a pass and then my husband can deliver. So half of it, my husband had to use his curfew pass and deliver them just because, and you can't compromise. Like the lady said, you can't compromise on quality and you can't compromise on time and if you say you deliver you need to deliver somehow uh, so those are the issues we mainly faced in terms of uh, the curfew and the lockdown so you again start like uh, i think all three of you summed up uh, basically thinking out of box uh, helped a lot in overcoming the challenges that you have been facing during the crisis right um uh, so let's um, um so this is a general question that I have for all three of you. Um, uh, this is usually we ask like uh, from everyone, all the Kikas founders, what was their uh, the Kikas moment and what is the worst moment that they had they have had in their uh, life as a founder. But I would like to like point put it down differently for three of you, where like logistics and logistics and operations itself is a nightmare. And it's so hard to find kick-ass moments and like, and it is so rewarding when there is one, right? So uh, what was your kick-ass moment and the worst moment in your life uh, when like in relation to the logistics and operations? Um, Savanti, you can go first. Sure. I'll start with the worst moment first so we can end with something positive. 
uh, one of the most trying moments for me was um, I think last year I had this huge installation uh, that we had to kind of install at this event um, and the setup time was very specific you could only enter between 10 p.m to 1 a.m and this installation could only be delivered through a truck um, so I used the same truck service that kind of transported this installation to my workshop to work on it I booked them you know to be there at 10 p.m so that I can transport this to the installation place um, and one key thing that you really had to remember is with whoever you work with, you can't expect all of them to have the same work ethic. Just because you tell someone, be here at this time, you need to follow up. You have to call and be like, you know, is everything on track? You have to remind them. It doesn't matter. So keeping to that process, I call them at like, I think, 8 p.m. And I was like, you know, is everything on track? I'll see you here at 10. And uh, then the truck guy is like, oh, no, yeah, we're not coming. And I was like, what do you mean you're not coming? Like, I had booked you, I'm paying you. And they're like, yeah, no, sorry, like, we can't come anymore. So this is like 8.30 in the night. I have this huge installation that only has this short time period to be installed. And now the truck guy is not coming. And I had just, I called every, like, delivery service. I even called Pick Me. And, like, everyone, it's in the middle of the night. I mean, you can't, they're not just going to release a truck. Whoever who can, they're full. Um, it was so nerve wracking because I was like, how? And I can't even physically carry this to the location because it's huge. <laughs> it's like 10 feet by six feet. I can't even put it in a vehicle. I literally need a lorry. Um, and then I actually even, you know, sent someone to the place where we were installing this because I assumed there'll be other trucks that would be there to drop off the other products to see if we can, you know, convince one of those truck guys to come and help me uh, transport this. And they were busy, but there were a few willing to come later on. But somehow down the line, like we got through to someone, convinced them it wasn't the exact vehicle we needed, but we just made do. Um, and I was able to transport it. It limited my installation time, but it was so nerve wracking and so unprecedented. Um, I did not have an uh, option B, C, D for that. Um, so that was definitely like one of the worst moments ever, but I'm glad like we got through that installation and everything was fine. Um, with that, like a more po on a positive note, a kick ass moment for me actually happened this month. Um, like Zainab, uh, not, not, sorry, not like Zainab, like Hafsa and Zainab. Um, I also have a team working for me. Um, and December is one of the busiest months, you know, people are ordering things as gifts. And I had taken on all these orders for the capacity of my team working with me as well. Um, and then in the beginning of December, the team who works for me went under an isolated area and could no longer come into work. So now I had work taken on for three people to do, which now had to be executed by one person. Um, and these last two weeks have literally been like early more. I've been like up working early morning, just few hours of sleep. I've been able to convince my family to help me out because I need to push these orders out. And, you know, like just surviving these two weeks for me has been such a kick-ass moment. I'm like, I made it and I've like done it and it's great. It's great to hear that you survived all of that, even the worst two, the greatest one. Uh, uh, what about you, Zainab? Oh, <laughs> well, our worst moment was, of course, um, because, again, because of the import restrictions and all, we had to discontinue some of our key products initially itself. When this happened, I was so devastated because it was a bread and butter. And this meant that I had to find a totally new way of getting through. So that we tried, but before discontinuing it, we actually tried um, adjusting the formula of it. It was actually a, a, a product that was part of the romantic package. So we had to, uh, we tried reinventing the formula, didn't work. We needed a specific ingredient. We couldn't find it in Sri Lanka. We couldn't find a substitute. So it was devastating. And inquiries were coming in and I just wanted to like huddle up somewhere and cry. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> Of course, that, that's not an option. So we had to discontinue it. And uh, that's definitely one of the worst things I had to experience. But the, the kick-ass moment, of course, is of course, after the hatch kick-ass bootcamp, where <laughs> when our sales again started picking up, our portfolio started diversifying and uh, we started moving forward. 
So, and again, we had like found new suppliers, new, new uh, ingredients, new materials, uh, new um, abilities of ours that we could, uh, for example, manufacture certain products, uh, certain ingredients all in house using Sri Lankan uh, ingredients. So that was one of the biggest, biggest achievements that we have uh, made so far. Um, I, I think I still remember uh, when you told us the news about how your sales picked up. Uh, it was during one of the classes, I think. Uh, uh, I remember. I still remember the excitement that you had, uh, <laughs> and it's so great to hear that uh, you had you got all of that out of uh, the Kikas boot camp and out of the mentors as well. Uh, so, Hafsa, uh, what is yours? Um, so one of my worst moments is uh, we had a really, really exciting uh, destination wedding in Thalpe and it was like a Pinterest board. It was so pretty. We prepped for it. And unfortunately, very last minute, they had to cancel. So, I mean, things like this, you can't really stop it, but you also need to accept that things like this do happen and you just need to move on. And another situation is my employees like some of these one of them is still under lockdown and I really miss her and it's really hard because you need to also do work for them so you just really need to push through and you just need to accept it and then move on like um, my best moment is even through lockdown we managed to get sold out for Mother's Day and we had over like 30 orders going all over the country and we were just like how are we going to handle it but we managed we just had to have backup plan after backup plan after backup um, but it turned out great. So that was like my kick ass cloud moment as we pushed through Mother's Day during a worldwide lockdown. That is great to hear. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, let's move on to some advices on tips that you guys have for uh, new founders or the founders who are struggling with logistics and operations in terms of their uh, businesses. Um, uh, so Savanthi, um, since you have been working with a lot of daily wage workers uh, from like suppliers to delivery uncles, you have been uh, working with them a lot, right? Uh, so what sort of advice or what, what, what tips do you have for them to turn around a disadvantageous uh, uh, situation into an advantage for their business uh, as a founder. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely had, you know, work with a few different parties who are daily wage earners. And one thing that I think is very key is when you do uh, have these people working with you is to really understand why they're doing it. You know, is this a side source of income? Is this a stopgap until they're waiting on another job? Or is this something that they're keen on doing for a while? Like, do they also identify with the brand? Is it something that they also would like to do? Um, so that understanding is very important. Um, and also it kind of has to be a win-win. Like them working for you and you working with them has to be beneficial for them as well. Uh, so if you have that communication and you make them understand your brand, uh, because sometimes, you know, what... The, what happens is they wouldn't pick up their, their phone because they don't want to say, I'm sorry, I can't come. I mean, that's like a normal issue here. People hate to, con you know, hate confrontation. So they just don't pick up their phone. They don't want to say no. Uh, so something I've kind of been able to, through communication, I've been able to explain to them is that, you know, just call me. It's okay if you can't come. It's okay if you're busy. It's okay if you have a family commitment. Just let me know. Um, and over the years, through this kind of dialogue with them, I've been able to get them also to be proactive with this. So even if, say, there's a funeral in the family, they'll call me and they'll be like, oh, now this happened, which means for the next five days, I'm not there, which helps my operational process because then I can kind of plan according to that. Um, so building that discipline is really key. And then also having that communication and understanding what they want uh, really helps you build that trust and loyalty. Um, and I've honestly been grateful enough. I've had this great uh, group of people who worked with me now for the last four years. Um, and that's on a, that's been through that communication and the trust and loyalty that we've had with each other. Um, so don't always think of it as what they are doing for your business. Think of what your business can do for them as well. Um, and I think that will really help you when you're working with uh, different uh, employees in your company. 
Thank you, Savanthi. Um, it is it is the right attitude towards the business for uh, everyone is very important when you are dealing with logistics and operations, right? Um, so Zainab, um, so we know that uh, you started in February and like when you started off as well that you sort of left a full-time job to start off as a founder, right? An entrepreneur. So when you like, uh, after the transition as well and uh, after gaining so much experience for the past few months what sort of key messages do you have for the founders who are thinking of starting a new who are in the middle of a uh, pandemic just like you who started off like in february i guess so uh, what sort of key messages do you have for them cool uh, one key message would be to be flexible and innovative don't say no, always try to find a way uh, because we're actually all in un facing unusual times right now. It's not the normal day and losing sales is obviously not an option. We need to go and we need to persevere. So that's number one. Secondly, it should be that you have to be in constant communication, like Savanti said, with your suppliers, with your partners, with your uh, customers. Because with all of these pressing issues that are happening right now, uh, people can easily forget your brand. And if they forget your brand, they're gonna forget uh, to contact you when they you know, have a requirement or even they won't even be inspired to do so. So that's the second one. And of course, thirdly, um, I'd actually like to quote a English proverb that I kind of live by. Um, if there's a will, there's a way. So, don't forget that great brands are actually the innovative fruits of adversity and you need to persevere. Thank you, Zainab. <laughs> um, so, Hafsa, um, any advices or tips from you when it comes to innovative uh, thinking out of the box uh, when, you, when you are running your business? Um. So I completely agree with both of them. You need to be flexible and you really, really need to think out of the box. You can't give up and say, oh, look, it's a pandemic. I can't do anything. There, there's no business. You need to figure out a way to fix it. And there's always a way. Like you just need to be patient and you just need to like sit down and think and figure out. Um, so one of it is, I think you just need to think out of, out of the box. The second one is consistent. Like, I don't know if you realize, but every single day, like a prayer, we've kept pushing content out on Instagram. We Every day we used to push um, our stories out. We didn't want our clients and all of our users to forget us. So we would constantly push our brand out, push videos. Push, like we were always thinking of content to push out. Because of course you don't want, even if you're in lockdown, people check their phones and you want to constantly re like remind them, look, we're here. Um, and you just need to push through. You need to be persistent. Like Zainab said, whatever happens, you need to keep trying. Like you need to push through whatever difficulty is. If it, difficulty is there, you need to kind of figure it out, have some patience and figure it out. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, so I also have one more question, but before that, uh, let's just check, check if anyone has any questions for you guys. Uh, so from the audience, do we have any questions? Uh, if there is, you can just drop it in chat. I'm just going to check our Facebook feed as well, just to see if we have any questions on that. Um, so uh, until, um, Alvin, can you just check on it and just let us know? So until uh, that, if we have any questions, we'll answer them. Okay. Um, so uh, until then, um, so uh, I have just one question that uh, I'm wanna, I want to like talk to you guys and like uh, before we uh, end, uh, what sort of, things would you guys do as startup founders to be better prepared for another crisis um, in terms of logistics and operations to anything, anything that you think has, uh, you were not prepared when like none of us were prepared obviously, but like now you know, right? So what is that one thing that you would do? Um, Savanti, do you want to 
process. But, yeah, I mean, one of the key things, issues that I had uh, when the pandemic hit was that although I had like, I had my raw materials and I had all of these things that I had stocked up, I also hadn't stocked up enough because usually I stock up for, let's say, a month and then I kind of replenish every month. Uh, but here we were like locked up for more than a month. Um, and that kind of made me realize that, you know, the importance of you do, you know, you've been in business, you do project, you know, how many products, what are your fast selling products, what are the sizes, dimensions, etc. So it's good to always have that stocked up, um, something that's uh, something that fits feasibly into your cash flow, but also look at having a bit more of a long term level of stock, especially because during this pandemic situation that really did affect me because I was able to push a few orders out, but then after a while, I'm also out of raw material and unable to do anything else. Um, so definitely being better prepared from your back end um, and also having a strong logistics arm. Do, I mean, it's been innovative to see that during the pandemic, there were a lot of operations that were also not logistical who started logistic arms. So you know, getting affiliated with one of them and working with them. So you're sure that they also, you know, are reliable and deliver your brand values so that now you are not constrained. If you have to face another lockdown, you have your material, you can make a product and you can also deliver it to your client. How about you, Zaina? Oh, uh, well, there are two things for me. One is that since we make natural bath and body products, usually uh, they la like they're good for six months. So now with the current pandemic, we have to find new alternatives because <laughs> for about three months we were in lockdown. <laughs> so that is one. So that's definitely one thing we are working on. And the second thing is uh, we are actually working on. Um, getting closer to logistical partners who actually have better relationships with the authorities so that we know for sure that as soon as the gates are open they'll be able to go and deliver our products and also they'll be able to communicate that to us so those are the two things we're working on uh, what about you Hafsa? Um, so like Savanta said one main thing that we also found difficult is we hadn't stocked up enough like we hadn't stocked up on our, like our floral foam and our baskets and our buckets and boxes so one thing I would do differently is definitely stock up just to be prepared um, and also I need to figure out how to work like remotely like I need to sort my technology out I need to use my google docs and my sheets properly and maybe use Google Forms and sort that out so that I can, in case we go into a pandemic, we can always do it through technology. To just be a bit more tech savvy, just because I feel like it's really helping this pandemic. That, that's great to hear. So uh, thank you so much, ladies. It was such an insightful session. Uh, so uh, just to sum up what we have been talking about for the past uh, 45 minutes. Uh, so it is very important to uh, actually have that list of, list of backups uh, when it comes to the suppliers, to the delivery guys, to everyone else. Uh, so it will be very important like uh, to have that list and uh, make sure that if you don't go ahead with, like if your A fails, you go to the plan B, or then plan C, D, E, F, if you have to like Z. Um, so, and the other thing uh, very important is you need to understand your brand value and uh, you need to work with, uh, especially when it comes to logistics and operations. And when it comes to brands that deal with logistics and operations in high level and which affects their brand, um, you need to understand your suppliers and also the delivery companies or the delivery guys are in par with your brand values as well to make sure that you uh, provide the service, the produce, the, the produce the products that you want to, right? Uh, and the uh, third thing that we would uh, also like to communicate during this session is uh, be creative. And that is one of the best uh, advices that we can give uh, to overcome challenges during a crisis be creative and innovative find way out of challenges through innovative ways don't do things uh, don't do illegal things but try to 
find something creative that can actually make your life so much easier and everyone else's as well uh, and uh, the other thing and the most important thing is like you are not the only person who is going through uh, uh, difficulties in logistics and operations you can always talk to the fellow founders always can talk to someone who is doing the similar business as you and find out because that is what we do at Kikas Bootcamp as well and like uh, all the alumni speak to each other find uh, delivery partners together who can deliver certain things so always talk to network with uh, the founders similar my uh, with similar mindset okay we do have uh, two questions I'm just uh, gonna okay uh, I'm just going to read out here and then we'll figure out who can answer that. Uh, so the first question is, uh, last mile delivery is very challenging for us, especially not having a reliable logistic vendor. How do you tackle that? Um, who can, um, Sawanti, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it definitely can be difficult. It honestly depends on the type of product uh, that you are sending across, like, what the product hubs I would send across, what I would send across, and someone who is working with food, what they would send across would be different. Um, what, I'm, what I've done as well is I've worked with different delivery partners to kind of identify who works best with me, who's the most reliable, because at the end of the day, what matters is that they pick up the phone, because uh, if the delivery is stuck, you need them to give you an update. You know your delivery is on the way, uh, it's going to reach your client so that you can communicate the same thing back to your client. Um, my advice would be definitely to try out these different uh, delivery partners. There's uh, Tribe Logistics, there's Connectco. Those are just a few logistic partners that I've used um, who are great. Uh, but again, it depends on your product. Um, so just try a few different logistical partners, see how they work, build your relationship with them. Um, and that's really how you can take it forward. Okay. Um, then there is a, a second question. Uh, being a small startup with not been big enough of a balance sheet, uh, we are not able to hold inventory. Uh, any tips on in inventory management? Um, who would like to take it? I think Sawanti, do you do inventory management, right? Uh, I, yeah. I think Zainab might have this as well because she gets a lot of uh, stuff down. Yeah. Would you like to take it up, Zainab? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so in our case, of course, uh, we do have the same issue. We do have inventory management. And what we have started noticing is because, again, because of COVID, you can't really stock up too much. The moment you do that and uh, the moment the lockdown comes in, you're just stuck with all this inventory, right? So yeah. what we started doing is we started actually um, managing our inventory in small batches. So we usually just plan ahead. If we start noticing that, for example, the news is uh, going in the wrong direction, <laughs> we would just, you know, start uh, the, with a low inventory, planning a low inventory for the next few months. Uh, or otherwise, what we would do is we would uh, just plan them in batches for certain uh, B2B companies or B2C uh, uh, customers. We would just keep it like that so that we can balance it through this situation and get out of it. So, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Zain and then Savanti. I hope that uh, your questions were answered. Uh, um, the name is not there. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um, we don't have uh, any more questions, so we can sort of uh, we can conclude the session. Before we conclude the session, I would like to uh, hold on. We have one question. Uh, yes. Um, how do you manage difficult clients and keep them happy? <laughs> Hapsa, do you want to take it? Since Sawanti and Zainab took one. <laughs> So all of us, I'm sure, have made, like struggled with difficult plans. And I've been blessed to not have such difficult plans, but you just need to compromise. And if they want something, you need to find, like you need to quickly think of something to resolve their problems. And I'm kind of also really good at um, doing that. <laughs> because you need to like quickly come up with a solution and kind of give it to them. Um, but at the end of the day, they are your client and they are paying you. So you need to give them what they've asked you for. 
somehow. <laughs> so you just need to kind of think on your feet and kind of keep them happy as well and give them what they've asked you for. Um, I would say like from my experience, like we also have clients, right? <laughs> just to add on to it, like uh, it's not just logistics and operations as well. So whatever the communication that you do, um, sort of like, uh, you know, take a breathe in, breathe out first, and then start replying to them or do whatever. And like, first calm yourself down if they are being very, very difficult. Because uh, if you if you don't think you can take, like uh, do it right now, just take, like keep your phones away, keep everything away and just take yourself, remove yourself out of that situation and just deal with yourself first and then deal with the client because it, it is so hard to um, gain clients and it is very, very easy to lose a client. So it is very important to keep that in mind when you're dealing with a difficult client as well. Um, and uh, uh, we have one more question. Um, any experience you guys want to share on your journeys in e-commerce? Um. Um, yeah, I can take this. I mean, we even, I mean, Shoelace has predominantly been on Instagram and on Facebook and all our orders and everything comes through that. Um, we've operated all these six years with that as well. So people are online all the time. And now, you know, you are able to shop off Instagram. You have Instagram shops. Um, there are so many platforms that have also come up where you can have, as a business, you can have your product there. Again, when you're positioning yourself in a platform, there'll be so many platforms that approach you. I mean, we've had so many platforms approach us. It's not key for you to be in every platform. You have to make sure that you're in platforms that also echo your brand value. Um, you can't just place your product somewhere where someone is offering you space in their e-com site. Uh, so be very wary when you do take on these uh, different platforms and you put yourself out there, put it somewhere that echoes your brand value. Uh, but also, I mean, I'm sure the ladies can speak to this. Instagram, Facebook, I mean, Instagram more for shoelace than Facebook. My majority of my customers are on Instagram. Um, it's the best place uh, to be because everyone is on Instagram. You're constantly on your phone, especially during the pandemic. You know, everyone's browsing it. And like Hapsa said, if you keep that constant line of communication, you keep pushing content, it's a great way to kind of build your follower base and build your client base and actually convert them into purchasing customers. Uh, anyone else would like to add their uh, thoughts? Hapsa, Zainab, do you want to add anything? Um, so like Savanti said, just to add to her is... Uh, on like the platform, she said, there are so many people who approach you saying, oh, we started the ETH platform, oh, we started another ETH platform. And you just have to be very, very careful. Like, don't have all of your products on all the platforms. It's going to be really difficult. Be very wise when you're choosing your platforms and be very, very selective. Just because we've had the experience of so many platforms approaching us and you just need to be careful when you pick, uh, select your platform. Instagram and Facebook are your, I mean, it's your page that's on your Instagram and Facebook. So you get full control of it. But when you're on a platform, you're basically, like you're not really, it's on your page. So just be very careful. Thank you. Thank you for those advices. So, um, okay, wait, I have one more question. Uh, what experience do you have in the florist field? Love your flower arrangements, by the way. Um, that's directed at you, Hafsa. <laughs> uh, so I've been doing a lot of events and I've been working at uh, two event companies, Sotaru IE and Weddings by Sonali, where I also met Samanti. Uh, and my mom absolutely loves flowers. And she has kind of uh, brought me up with the whole fresh flowers thing. And every time we have events, my cousins always run to me and ask me to do flowers for them. So I know my flowers because I've done so much of decorations for them. Uh, and that's how I actually built and got my way through the florist field. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, and thank you, so hold on. 
guys one more food cue like i can't uh, <laughs> uh how, how do you balance family and business involvement during challenges mm i think everyone can answer we can go from like starting from savanthi sure um for me family and business involvement has been extremely positive i mean they're watching it right now i'm not saying it because they're watching <laughs> uh but they've been very helpful from the time that we started they are the people who transport all my things to my pop ups um who you know take me around whenever i need to get anything to even to day when things go wrong who kind of step in and you know make the things for me so it's been completely positive but from my point of view when i did start off i i did not have a good balance with family and you know spending time with them because i would only be like focused on work or I'll be stressed or you know that's all I'm focusing on um so one thing I that I did force myself to do was also have a cut off time because the problem is when you have a business is it's not like working for someone else you never want to shut off because you want to constantly keep you know working because you're like you know I need to keep doing this and you don't really have a cut off time and that compromises on your time with your family uh so one thing I did was i kind of have kind of put in a cut off time for myself where after this point i'm not going to work i'm just going to you know relax and like spend this time with my family or spend this time with my friends and you know go back to work then the next day so it's important to bring that work life balance as well for yourself especially if you're doing a sole business it's very easy to get carried away because you never shut down you're just constantly like going forward um zaina Yes so it has um, even my family has been quite supportive right from the beginning uh, i remember i initial pop ups uh, they were the ones who actually moved all the products from our warehouse to the pop up stores and uh, sometimes they would uh, actually be there when i couldn't um, so it has been quite positive and they have definitely been my biggest support system uh, but like samanthi said it's so easy to um, Uh, the lines between business and family can easily blur uh, since you're working solely on your business you even on a trip i found myself you know just trying to make a sale or trying to make another sale <laughs> or trying to find you know a new supplier that happens that's natural but you need to find a balance because there's um, you know the business is definitely a very important part of life but uh, so is family so that's all up sir um so like the other girls said family my family is huge and they're all so so supportive and like they're such an amazing bunch of cheerleaders to be honest every time i'm down every time i'm like oh no i can't do this they're always like no you can you've done so much uh, especially my husband and my parents they've always pushed me through uh, and yes of course like you can't shut like you can't shut your brain because you're constantly thinking of your business even at travel and you're like oh no it's just one dm let me reply it might be a possible sale um but i realized to have a cut off time and say look after 8 o'clock i'm so sorry i'm only going to check your messages afterwards uh, so i think if you are a startup and you want to balance your work and family life have a cut off time and say look i can't take it after 8 o'clock and another thing i realized is i realized to say no to orders if i'm full i'm full like I can't take in so many orders and work till the middle of the night and kind of um just cuz I also need to spend time with my family in the nights and that's when we get to all spend time together so yes uh it's important to say no and to have a cut off time to some it all uh, it is very very important to know your limits and boundaries how you can uh, do your business uh, and say no to things as well right um yeah uh, do we have any more questions uh, i i do have one more question uh, i think that this might be the last question that we are taking uh, so um if you have any other questions i will also uh, let you guys know how you can reach out to these ladies uh, Uh, offline as well so this question is uh, about uh, for everyone actually 
so as mostly instagram based businesses have you all do you all have any pl uh, plans in place to move beyond instagram or social media um sawante would you like to take it first um yes i mean we have uh, just last year or so we started also having a products retailing at a few outlets um which is also great because customers also our products are such where it's a touch and feel and when you see it you want to purchase it or sometimes it's an impulse buy and although we do custom orders we also understand that people are very last minute uh, so like hapsa said when they're like oh i need this tomorrow um when we're just operating online we like, we can't cater to that but if you do have your products in a few retail spaces you can now say you know what we have our products available here like we have this range you can go shop from there um so that's something that we have done i mean moving into my own retail space is not something um that i really thought of or wanted to do um i i'd rather partner with other retailers who are in line with my brand uh, values and kind of have our products there with all these other great uh, local brands um, so that definitely does help and it's definitely a step that you should also look at taking based on your product what about you say um actually even we have started moving into the retail space um because what we noticed was through instagram social media and online there is so much that you can reach beyond that people want to touch they want to feel um you know when they go to a mall they are going there to buy so why don't we also just put our products up there and uh, of course it's not very feasible for us to have our own store right now but uh, there are several other um, other stores that are willing to have our products and that's how we be moving forward uh hapsa uh i would love to have an open my own outlet soon but right now everyone seems to want everything to be delivered uh, so i just and a lot of people have also approached us and said look you can maybe share a pop up with us but everyone seems to want it want things delivered um so i feel like right now is not a good time in the future hopefully yes we want to expand and have our own outlet so just as a like a uh, like a person who loves flowers uh, um, it might be because like you are mainly based out of instagram as well <laughs> and if there is a flower shop i would definitely visit you <laughs> because the flower arrangements are pretty like so beautiful as yes, well uh so yeah thank you so much uh, guys um uh, is there anyone else who would like to take another question okay uh, there are no more questions uh, in the q and a um uh, so it was very insightful and knowledgeable and thank you so much for sharing all your experience and uh, insights into the, how you guys handled logistics and operations during the crisis um uh, so um thank you so much hafsa sawanti and zainab uh, for joining us and having uh, sharing your experience with everyone else and uh, thank you so much for everyone who is in the audience uh, on zoom as well as facebook and all the families of all these three female founders who have joined uh, thank you so much again um, because of your support and um, support uh, they have made so they have come a long journey as well and uh, it has been very rewarding from what, what i'm hearing <laughs> uh, so um, so just before we conclude our session this Week we have uh, our final chapter, the chapter four, uh, which is coming up next Tuesday, uh, with three amazing panelists who are going to share their uh, how they handled challenges and how they started their own businesses and basically the um the to sum up everything that we have been talking about. thrive in crisis episode so um we will be releasing who our panelists are on friday on our facebook pages as well uh, so tune in next uh, tuesday as well at 6 pm join us uh, to talk and celebrate three wonderful women uh, founders with us uh, so thank you so much again everyone uh, have a very good night bye thanks asmini thanks for having us thank you thanks asmini see you guys you bye